Greetings to all those present. My name is Ankit Malhotra. I am the co-founder and president of the Jindal Society of International Law. Today we have speakers who are distinguished scholars and authors of groundbreaking and cutting edge research when it comes to approaches and understandings of international law. But before I introduce them and the topic which they'll be speaking about, let me share a few words about the Center for UN Studies which aims to develop a learning platform on opportunities and limits of the United Nations by enhancing the research and building knowledge on how the United Nations systems work, both in terms of institution development and in terms of promotion and implementation of various multilateral policies. In my discussions with Professor Bupalski over the years, he has reminded me what in 1953, the first UN Secretary General Trigov Lee said when he welcomed his successor, Dag Hamshkot. He said, and I quote, welcome Dag to the most impossible job on this earth, end quote. The United Nations has often been criticized and turned into a scapegoat when it comes to states who have failed to live up to its initial expectations. But let us also remember what Hamshkot famously said, it's perhaps as a response. I quote Hamshkot who said, the UN was not created to take us to heaven, but to save us from hell. End quote. Similarly, the Center for UN Studies engages in projects that study the history and tradition, but also take a transformative approach to research, teaching, and societal engagement, having in mind the latest geopolitical and technological shifts. The Jindal Society of International Law, which is created under the aegis of the Center for UN Studies, is aimed and is guide, guided expertly by Professor Dr. Weston Kupalski. The society was founded in 2020 and is an initiative which provides platform to young international law enthusiasts. The inaugural address and official launch of the society was on the 18th day of November, 2020. It was inaugurated by the Herbert and Rose Rubin Professor of International Law, Jose Enrique Alvarez of New York University, along with the respected Dr. Rksi Rajkumar, who was also the Vice Chancellor of the University, along with Professor Dr. Weston Kupalski, and a very dear friend of the society, Professor Dr. Mohan Kumar. Our four lecture series of 2021, exploring the ecosystem of international law, builds upon the introduction given on internationalism and international law by the concluded spring lecture series titled Future of Internationalism and International Law. The four lecture series endeavors to study the different contours of international law. To assist in the study, the speakers will cover and address their respective areas of expertise based upon their years of research and practice. Given the vast ecosystem and the engagement of international law in it, the society aims to study the fragmentation and fertilization of the various disciplines in this ecosystem. The lowest common denominator in the four lecture series is to enhance and provide a deeper understanding of international law through international lawyers. The society for its members is a well of knowledge and a quorum of thought provoking discussions, which is a resultant of its engagements with experts aimed to explore the ecosystem of international law. Today, amongst us, we have Professor Balakrishnan Bala Raja Gopal, who is an associate professor of law and development at the Department of Urban Studies and Planning and is a special UN rapporteur on the right to adequate housing. He founded the program on human rights and justice at Massachusetts Institute of Technology and Displacement Research and Action Network. Professor Raja Gopal is also currently counselor of the American Society of International Law and he has been a member of the Executive Council of the Executive Committee of the Society. He is a faculty associate at Harvard Law School's program on negotiation and been as a fellow at the Woodrow Wilson Center for International Scholars in Washington, D.C the Madras University of Developmental Studies, the Jawaharlal Nehru University in India, the Institute for Advanced Studies at Sheshenburg University, in Hebrew University, and a visiting professor at the UN University for Peace. Professor Raja Gopal has also been a leading scholar and participant of the Third World Approaches to International Law. Professor Chimney, who retired as a professor of international law from the Jawaharlal Nehru University in 2017 has also served as the Vice Chancellor for West Bengal National University jurisdiction. 
jurisdictional sciences, Kolkata from 2004 to 2006. He has also been a visiting professor at Brown and Tokyo universities and has held visiting professors, professorships at Harvard and Cambridge. He's an associate member of the Institute de Droit International and a member of the Academic Council of the Institute for Global and Policy, Harvard Law School. He sits on the editorial board of several international journals, including the American Journal of International Law. He is the editor-in-chief editor of the Indian Journal of International Law. He is associated with the Third World Approaches to International Law, a network which articulates a critique on contemporary international law and institutions from the perspective of Global South. This is also the topic for today's discussion, the meaning and relevance of Twail in the 21st century. As one of our most recent speakers, Professor Marty Koskinemi said, international law oscillates from utopia to apology. With those words, I invite Professor Bala Krishnan to start, and we will then have comments from Professor Chimney. Professor Gopal, Raju Gopal, the floor is yours. Thank you, Ankit. Um, and thank you to Jindal Global Law School and uh, the Society for inviting me for this. And uh, I'm delighted to join this. I, I regret that I'm not able to join all of you in person, um, but um, hopefully soon, uh, the post-pandemic world will be with us. And um, I'm particularly delighted about today because um, of the chance to see my old friend, uh, Professor Chimney, and uh, <clears throat> although virtually only today, uh, but a chance to continue um, a dialogue and a conversation that uh, has been ongoing between many of us, including Professor Chimney, um, for at least uh, two decades, if not more, um, since the time when we encountered each other in the 90s, when I was a student at Harvard Law School doing my SJD. Um, and um, uh, and then, of course, continued in various ways in formal and informal settings, both uh, in trail conferences, um, as well as, of course, in our living room and 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 you know um, dining room conversations in both of our houses over the years. So I'm really looking forward to this. And as you can imagine, as uh, for a conversation between two of us who have conversed quite a lot and engaged with each other's work, uh, I don't have anything really new to say. Uh, I don't have a killer new point about the purpose and relevance of third world approaches to international law today. Uh, of course, I strongly believe in the relevance of the third world approach to international law uh, and its various manifestations. And um, I think many of us engage with it in different ways. And I thought maybe what I can do is to sort of, uh, you know, maybe make some remarks along the following lines. First, uh, maybe say a couple of few words about a couple of broad themes that have structured my own engagement with uh, third world approaches to international law. As an international lawyer, what is been sort of some of my, you know, primary uh, sort of area of concerns. And uh, secondly, um, because this is a chance to have Professor Chimney to respond to me and to dialogue, uh, to shamelessly take advantage of this opportunity to, um, to, to, you know, essentially put some issues on the agenda that have been on my mind uh, that I've been dialoguing about. Is some issues that actually came out of the most recent trail conference in um, uh, in Singapore that was organized a few years ago by uh, Professor Tony Angi there. So I thought I'd just uh, mention some of these issues and uh, then we'll see where the conversation goes. Okay, so. First, a uh, couple of uh, very broad themes that I think, uh, you know, are nothing new, as I said, but uh, have, I've tried to sort of uh, engage with it over the years uh, in my writings, but also uh, I must say I acutely feel it uh, as these as being relevant in um, my role as a UN Special Rapporteur 
on housing or in various other engagements that I have with international law. Um, so, I mean, the first is the pluralization of normative and institutional spaces where international law gets made, applied and uh, interpreted, rejected, etc. cetera, um, which I think is a critical contribution of a third world approach to international law because the reality was that uh, at least 20 years ago, when many of us started talking about third world approach to international, I would say even today, despite the uh, token acknowledgement of uh, this reality, most of the mainstream approaches to international law remained very uh, Westphalian in nature um, and um, had a particularly black box conception of uh, for example, basic ideas like the state and uh, the relationship between state and society. But I think, you know, for many of us, this was an unsatisfactory account of how international law gets made and certainly how it is interpreted and applied in the real world. And we saw a lot of different actors interacting with each other, a lot of, instead of one sort of level at which something called international law gets made and then gets transferred to other areas for implementation, which is a kind of a dominant way of thinking about international law. For example, through treaty to, to implementation of treaties or through gradual formation of customary law and so on. There was a more dynamic uh, process of interaction between legal orders, uh, between local and national uh, and, and global and transnational legal orders and formal and informal legal orders and social practices. And what we needed was a more dynamic theory at the international level to try to capture some of this, some of this reality. And uh, the extant theories of, um, of uh, uh, shall we say, uh, social uh, studies of law, for example, um, theories around legal pluralism uh, themselves remained uh, very much Westphalian or remained within a nation state centric framework. Uh, I mean, legal pluralism really largely developed within a nation state centered experience. Uh, of course, first in the colonial context, but then in the post colonial context, but never really was intended to capture this process of dynamism across different legal orders and processes. And international relations theories, which uh, sought to account for the rights of non-state actors or sought to sort of acknowledge the role of uh, non-formal or informal sources of law uh, seemed uh, unsatisfactory as they always seemed incomplete. For example, they had hardly anything to say about courts uh, and judicial lawmaking and decision-making. The word courts did not even appear in most of the leading international relations, you know, works of the 90s, for example, that was trying to theorize how to account for non-state actors. Uh, but the basic dissatisfaction with international legal theories that they remained Westphalian and critical international theories that were emerging on the horizon, whether it's um, uh, critical approaches coming from allied sort of areas like feminism or critical race theory themselves seem caught up in their own national imagination or national narratives uh, or particular constellations of power that did not seem to offer a satisfactorily pluralistic account of law in the global sense. And um, I uh, feel that in many ways, we have made some, some progress. Uh, I, I wouldn't say in, uh, in, uh, in uh, kilometers and miles, but in inches and uh, feet, perhaps, towards uh, trying to theorize uh, our way towards a more satisfactory account of, uh, you know, a more robust account of the role of uh, law uh, or a more satisfactorily pluralistic account of law in the global sense. Um, now, uh, to make uh, what I mean by this uh, pluralistic sense more concrete, let me give you an example of the role played by uh, 
many non-state actors in the global level uh, in interaction with and by acting through and often acting on behalf of state interests. So where the so-called boundary line between state and non-state becomes you know, an artificiality. Um, for example, uh, if we observe the process of negotiation that led to the, well, I, would, I shouldn't say just negotiation, process of struggle and uh, articulation and negotiation that led to the uh, adoption of the Declaration on the Rights of Peasants at the UN Human Rights Council. Um, what we clearly see and what is increasingly acknowledged in scholarship is of course that uh, the declaration was driven by the uh, efforts of uh, a, a robust social movements such as uh, you know, La Via Campesina uh, over many years. And uh, in turn, uh, the uh, lawmaking process itself was a dynamic process that resulted from uh, state input and state interactions between each other and at the UN Human Rights Council the role of uh, uh, a highly statist mechanism such as the UN itself, along with uh, uh, a very critical sort of interactive sort of role played by La Via Campesina in not just the contribution of uh, the ideas, but providing the political framework for the adoption of uh, the declaration itself. And going forward, I would anticipate that if this declaration has any chance of uh, uh, being meaningful for the lives of those for whom it was intended, namely the lives of peasants, it's going to depend very much on the role of a movement like La Via Campesina. It's not something that you can leave to the states and say, oh, the statement, the declaration has been adopted, now the states will go ahead and implement it. We all know that that's not how implementation happens um, at the global level. Um, uh, I can also give the example of uh, the adoption of various voluntary guidelines at the Committee on World Food Security of the Food and Agriculture Organization. For example, the voluntary guidelines on the responsible governance of tenure in land uh, adopted in 2012, which has been uh, a something that resulted from a similar process of interaction between um, uh, pluralistic uh, actors that can be understood only in a pluralistic sense and uh, voluntary guidelines on food systems and nutrition uh, more recently adopted uh, all of which see a mix of um, state and non-state actors uh, formal and non-formal politics uh, and expertise of various kinds, legal expertise being only one of them, but other forms of expertise come to bear on the making of these kinds of guidelines. Um, then we have uh, the making of uh, formal declarations that are slowly becoming or coming to the status of uh, at least general principles, if not customary rules of international law, such as, for example, declaration of new rights, such as the right to water and sanitation declared you know, in the year 2010, I believe, uh, which again resulted from a similar process of uh, pluralistic lawmaking uh, in international law. Um, I look at the beyond human rights, uh, one can look at the uh, environmental law field as another one where quite a dynamic process of uh, interaction between formal and informal norms, formal and informal actors, and uh, lawmaking and law application at multiple levels all interact with each other in very dynamic ways to produce new understandings of law, new normative standards. I'm thinking of international mechanisms, um, uh, agreements such as the International Agreement on Marine Biodiversity, for example. Uh, so, all in all, we have a broad framework of, uh, 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 we need a broad framework of interaction between actors, a broader framework for interaction between legal orders at various levels, where we cannot confine ourselves to this black box 
called international law, at least as it was articulated by Europeans, to understand what we mean by international law today. Uh, we need a new concept of international law that is more dynamic in nature. A second uh, broad point that I want to make, uh, something that, uh, again, I've tried to sort of assert and argue for over the years, is that um, the nature of the politics of lawmaking is something that we need to understand as one that involves both a hegemonic and counter hegemonic framework to fully comprehend it. Uh, now, hegemonic, the term hegemonic international law was, um, has been with us at least since uh, Detlef Blatt's, you know, kind of reminded us about the nature of uh, hegemonic international law in an article in the American Journal of International Law many years ago. But it was largely uh, an analysis of hegemonic international law status, uh, especially with the role, with the, with the focus on the role of a dominant country, for example, in the making of international law and in the determination of the meanings of international law, such as a country like the United States in the case of debt rats. Um, but uh, we know, uh, given the work of many scholars since um, at least the 1980s, um, that the framework for hegemonic and counter hegemonic understandings of international legal orders and international relations is something that we need to take seriously. I'm thinking of the work of uh, someone like Robert Cox, for example, influenced by uh, Gramscian understandings. Uh, was seen a, a world hegemony as a, an economic, political, and a social structure. Um, and um, uh, and uh, most importantly, drawing on Gramsci, uh, to pay attention to the affective element in understanding counter hegemony, including the role of agency. That is the way in which actors themselves are transformed as they seek to transform a structure. I think it's very important for us to sort of keep this in mind because it kind of reminds us of the both the objective as well as the subjective nature of international law. That is international law of course matters a great deal because we seek to create it, we seek to sort of figure out what that means you know, as a set of norms, but in the process of trying to create it and trying to attribute meaning to it, we ourselves undergo change as human beings as at a subjective or intersubjective level. And uh, I think it's very important for us not to lose sight of the effective element in understanding counter hegemony. Now, counter hegemonic international laws, I've tried to argue in the past, bridges both you know, hegemonic and counter hegemonic understandings but assigns a clear agency to the role of uh, subaltern groups and social mobilization, including through the role of social movements, uh, while recognizing the relationship between the so-called elite and non-elite sectors, or between intellectuals and the popular, uh, or between the formal and the informal, or between the legal and the illegal, in an effective sense, this is all following Gramsci, nothing new there, but basically uh, an attempt to sort of capture these. Um, the key difference between hegemonic and counter hegemonic uh, politics or law, it's not something we can get into much here, but I think it's very important to sort of remember that, you know, the way uh, somebody like Professor Detlev Watts, when he articulated the notion of hegemonic international law, confine the source of politics to state politics and the mode of politics to institutional forms, including explicitly sort of uh, forms that are explicitly linked to state actions um, and an understanding of normativity as a hierarchical normativity, not a normative pluralism at all, but this is not how, you know, counter hegemonic international law you know, uh, has been understood um, in terms of the source of politics, instead of states, we pay attention not just to states, but to the role of social movements. The mode of politics, instead of institutional alone, we pay attention to extra-institutional or even oppositional 
forms of politics. And in terms of normativity, you know, clearly we have a, as I've argued so far throughout, uh, normative pluralism uh, as opposed to normative singularity. The normative singularity is the main sort of approach in mainstream approaches to international law. And I, uh, I, along with many others in the trail community, I think have tried to sort of push back against it over the years. So uh, what uh, uh, I think, I know I, I would sort of uh, shift now to saying a few, uh, remarking a few uh, things about uh, what uh, we might actually think of as the, uh, as the consequences or the relationship between uh, some of the main themes that have emerged from Twail, uh, uh, third world approach to international law and literature for some of the other uh, areas of uh, social sciences or humanities where similar quote unquote searches are ongoing, uh, particularly in given where I am in the urban studies department, uh, I thought I'd say a few words about some recent efforts uh, that I've seen uh, uh, pick up a significant amount of momentum in the last uh, decade or so towards what one might call as a southern turn or a southeastern turn in urban studies. Urban studies was very much a Western, you know, sort of a, a discipline, a discipline located within the historical and uh, material sort of experiences of uh, the global cities of the North. Uh, but as uh, uh, globalization and as, sorry, uh, as urbanization has become much more global in nature and uh, uh, the, with the emergence of uh, urbanization as a more uh, Southern phenomenon as well, especially the emergence of uh, cities across the global South, that is a, an increasing sort of uh, attempt to try to theorize uh, what urban studies scholars have been calling as a southern turn in uh, urban studies. And to try to engage with some of these uh, other, uh, that is other meaning those areas of uh, scholarship that are outside of international law, how they might actually uh, interact with uh, some of the ways in which Twail has thought about the idea of the South, the idea of the third world, and then what we might learn as third world scholars, uh, third world international law scholars from the way those scholars are thinking about their own fields, uh, we actually have been pushing for more dialogue between these um, multiple diverse areas of, uh, of uh, disciplines. And uh, in the uh, Singapore trail conference, uh, like I mentioned, uh, one of those attempts consisted of an attempt to engage with the scholar uh, Oren Yuftahel, one of the leading geographers and um, uh, an urban uh, theorist uh, uh, writing on the southern and southeastern turn in urban studies today. And it was uh, quite an extraordinary conversation that uh, led to further uh, efforts on the part of urban theorists to try to think about what does a Southern F, uh, theory in urban studies mean today? And uh, since the Singapore conference, there have been two other meetings, including one in London that uh, uh, I was privileged to be a part of. Uh, I must say I was uh, very much very extra privileged because as an international lawyer, I did not belong in that meeting. It was a group of, of mostly geographers and urban scholars, but I was part of, I was allowed to be part of this conversation and it was a very much a learning experience for me. And uh, I, I must say that uh, I was pleasantly surprised at the, at, the, uh, uh, at the number of themes from Twail that intersected with the concerns or central concerns of geographers and urban theorists. And I would just put across a few of these themes that I uh, found in these encounters before you, and then uh, we could sort of uh, leave it at that. So uh, I must also Dave, say that this, uh, I have a selfish motive in discussing this today uh, because 
the conversations that we started in Singapore that continued in London are going forward and we are uh, organizing a workshop soon, uh, perhaps at MIT, on further uh, dialogue between uh, different ways of theorizing the South or the third world and what that might mean for uh, urban studies, for example, and where Twail and the engagement between Twail and uh, uh, urban studies more broadly uh, might be one of the anchors. Uh, so some, what are some of the key things that resonated from Twail for me when I listened to and try to understand the concerns of geographers and urban scholars. So first, there is the history and legacy of colonialism, which of course is a central theme for Twail scholars to sort of correct what, what we felt was an overwhelming Eurocentrism of the discipline of international law. So uh, well known uh, are the fact that central doctrines such as sovereignty, and the evolution of modern international institutions have been rehistoricized, including by the pioneering work of scholars such as uh, Professor Chimney, uh, uh, to root them more firmly in the history and legacy of colonialism. Uh, taking history seriously, and especially colonial history, remains, uh, I found, uh, uh, in the concerns of urban scholars, one of the main sort of challenges in urban studies. Uh, because often uh, what urban scholars are facing are quite similar to what we face in international law, certainly, you know, in the 80s and 90s, that a series of so-called universal histories of the discipline, which maintain hegemonic understandings of urban planning, for example, of, of the process of urbanization, and the reproductions of power relations that uh, remain kind of invisible in the process of this, uh, especially under conditions of what you might call as uh, today's global capitalism or what you might call as global racial capitalism, which structures the process of uh, urbanization in today's world, where we see not just the process of urban expansion, but the process of balkanization and segregation between classes between deep inequalities and as well as the manipulation of class differences to engender primordial sort of uh, conflicts between people in terms of religion, in terms of caste, in terms of race. And this is uh, happening in Africa, this is happening in United States, it's happening in Europe, it's happening in Asia, uh, it's a global condition. Uh, a second theme that I felt resonated from Twail was uh, the importance of thinking and acting through context or place. Now, of course, this is not a central contribution of Twail alone. This is a, the, the, the focus on place or context is something that has been emphasized by many critical legal uh, uh, theories, um, uh, um, even before Twail. But the contrary to the to the quote unquote space of law and legal categories in the abstract, for example, uh, legal categories such as property or freedom of contract. This is one of the classic sort of understandings of earlier critical theories of law. And drawing on other critical tradition, 12 scholars have been arguing for many years about the importance of place based thinking and praxis and the relevance of contextual approaches. Uh, what Earlier, I referred to also as pluralistic or a more robust pluralistic understanding of law is a kind of a call for a more contextual approach. In urban planning, the focus on place appears to emerge as a major theme of Southern approaches, as well as a as part of a focus on critical approaches to the practice of uh, urban studies. So one encounters, for example, uh, a, an emphasis on um, such terms as reflective practice, which is a key sort of theoretical dynamic in urban theories or urban planning, or participatory action research, uh, PAR. Um, uh, but uh, 
uh, with their own internal critique about whether such approaches go far enough, as uh, especially in terms of the way in which they uh, accommodate and uh, uh, seek to sort of uh, keep in place the role of expertise and the role of experts in general. Um, a third theme that I felt resonated from Twail for uh, these conversations outside of Twail was uh, claiming of a counter hegemonic space through rethinking the category of uh, the South or Southeast. Uh, or in the case of Twail, we have argued for rethinking the category uh, uh, called third world to try to reinterpret it. Uh, so a key oppositional move in 12 was to appropriate the term third world as a language of resistance and emancipation rather than one that signifies marginalization, oppression, and backwardness. So uh, that is quite familiar, especially in the Indian context, for example, it's not because it's not dissimilar to the move by other subaltern groups such as Dalits in India to deliberately choose a moniker which highlights their subjugation as a term of resistance, not of pity of, or of charity. Uh, I interpret the recent uh, Southern or Southeastern turn in urban studies as a similar one sharing some similar uh, motives. Um, uh, the key issue, I believe, is uh, whether there's a possibility of a counter-hegemonic approach to urban planning, as uh, we have seen in the case of uh, uh, law, international law, where I have argued that there is indeed a possibility for a counter-hegemonic approach to international law. Uh, but I do believe uh, that there is a possibility of counter-hegemonic approach to urban planning. For example, uh, community-based or insurgent planning uh, that are uh, intended specifically to challenge the, the narratives that are embedded in dominant planning approaches. For example, if a city puts out a master plan, for example, you could actually offer a counter plan to show that the master planning's assumptions often involve erasures of whole communities. And we have seen that being done successfully by urban planners like Oren Iftahel, in uh, in uh, Israel, uh, where he has uh, you know worked for many years with communities that are affected by the exclusionary policies of the Israeli government, uh, particularly the Bedouin communities in the in the Negev, uh, where this kind of counter planning has been very effective as a way to push back against uh, the use of master planning to exclude. Uh, uh, what you might call as invisible communities. Um, so uh, I also see that urban studies scholars seem to have moved fairly rapidly to accept the idea that the South, the, the term South is not a physical geographical concept and that it could include subaltern groups in the North and then the South together. Um, in, I would say in international law, we are still working our way through, but this understanding has after many years gradually taken, uh, received at least received a certain level of uh, acceptance, uh, although in much internal disagreement continues. Uh, the idea that uh, we need to move uh, the idea of the third world beyond a strictly physical geographical category. Uh, a fourth uh, theme that I uh, felt that resonated from Trail was. Um, the uh, pluralism of epistemology and cognitive justice. Uh, one key motivation for Twail was to question the politics of knowledge production in law, including the centrality of courts and the centrality of uh, 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 the judiciary as a site of uh, 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 lawmaking uh, and epistemology, essentially, uh, the centrality of judges and to legal experts and uh, uh, to recover and reinscribe uh, uh, for Twail the normative uh, equivalence of ordinary people's voices to make them as being equally law creators and lawmakers. Uh, uh, it's also an attempt, I would say, to recognize the actually existing pluralism uh, 
of law and the resulting fragmentation in the uh, epistemology of law, uh, rather than seeing such fragmentation at that level as a threat, I think many in the trail community have celebrated as a major pathway towards cognitive justice. And uh, I see a lot of that happening in urban studies towards epistemological pluralism, including the recognition of non-expert voices, particularly including in approaches such as participatory action research. Um, a fifth theme um, that I see resonating from Twail has to do with uh, the way Twail has emphasized the importance of uh, taking resistance more seriously uh, and to write that resistance into law itself. One of the major Twail themes is to sort of, I would say, push for the what one might call as the jurist generative role of resistance. Um, that, that resistance not only creates new law, it transforms our understanding and interpretation of law and thus practice, not just legal practice in a narrow sense, but social practice more broadly. The primary focus of Twail scholarship in highlighting resistance in from my scholarship has been that of the role of social movements as uh, as well known uh, for those who have engaged with my work uh, of uh, movements, both at the local, regional, or global level and their impact on law. Now, while urban studies recognizes the constitutive role of social movement, a distinctive Southern approach in urban studies is not yet as dominantly engaging or identified with the, the role of social movements as uh, it has been the case in international law. And nor is the idea that resistance itself is constitutive of urban planning. Uh, it still remains as a, an oppositional enterprise, mainly something outside of what we might consider as formal planning. Um, <clears throat> so uh, I find it quite fascinating and I'm, I still don't know why that's the case, why it has been more possible to argue that in the legal context, uh, but not so far may seen as possible in urban uh, studies. Uh, a sixth and final sort of uh, theme that I thought re that resonated from Twail is the idea of the limits of law in the Anthropocene. There is a basic theme in Twail literature. It's a deep critique of the Anthropocene, especially of its programmatic realization through industrial capitalism, and particularly of the notion of development and globalization. Uh, and there have been multiple strands of the critique of development and globalization, including of uh, the neoliberal foundations of some of the so-called modern areas of international law, such as international trade or international finance, for example. Much of the early work of uh, Trail thus has much in common with the uh, critical currents that came from outside of uh, law, such as uh, post-development theory, you know, uh, or what today in Europe is called the, the theories concerning degrowth. Uh, in urban studies, one doesn't quite see critical approaches in this sense, of course, with the exception of scholars such as David Harvey, who have of course been very much focusing on the uh, on the question of planning uh, in the especially in the context of industrial capitalism and uh, globalization, offering a powerful counter critique to those notions. But um, it uh, uh, it is not a uh, a still a significant part of what you might call as a southern approach uh, and Harvey's own work is not something I would necessarily associate as being Southern in, uh, in nature, um, uh, uh, however important it is for other reasons. So anyway, as an outsider to urban studies, this was kind of a puzzle for me as well. So I'm just putting this puzzle out there in front of you. So I think I've spoken enough uh, um, and uh, maybe I should just uh, stop there and say, 
I, I think I find the process of globalization, or sorry, urbanization and global urban changes to be quite fascinating because of the nature of the challenges that it presents, but also in terms of the way in which the, 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 the scholarship that kind of sees itself as urban, uh, urban theories uh, coming from geography and urban, the, uh, urban uh, studies, and they <clears throat> are grappling with issues that are quite similar to the one that we were grappling with as uh, 12 scholars uh, not so long ago, and we are still grappling with them. So I think it's all been quite fascinating. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir. I think, I think what you've illustrated in the last point captures it perfectly. It sort of seeps through into the crevices of not only perspective, but also ideology and, and influences all aspects of life. Uh, I request Professor Chimney to, to, to share his comments and we'll take up questions afterwards. I do encourage whoever wants to share questions to please kindly do so in the chat box. We'll club them and, and we'll take them up in the end. Uh, Professor Chimney. Thank you. Uh, um, thank you, Raj, for those extremely rich and uh, illuminating uh, remarks. Uh, uh, I just want to apologize to the uh, audience uh, for not uh, switching on my video as I have just gone through uh, some dental surgery. Um, uh, now, it's really a privilege for me uh, to be sharing this virtual space uh, with uh, Professor Balakrishna Rajagopal, uh, who, as you all know, uh, has been a pioneering figure in the TWAIL movement. Uh, he has made uh, very fundamental contributions to the articulation of twelve, uh, and some of the themes on which uh, uh, he has uh, sort of written uh, were touched uh, touched upon by him. I've really nothing much to add to uh, what uh, uh, Raj has uh, Raj has uh, said. Uh, other than perhaps uh, take up one or two themes uh, that uh, he has flagged for us, uh, not only today, but for over the last three decades. Um, and the one sort of important theme has been um, uh, the very meaning of trail. Uh, uh, it's often very, uh, it's very often mistaken uh, uh, for being a geographical project. Uh, but as uh, uh, Raj has clarified in his earlier writings and today, uh, TWAIL is both a geographical project. It does talk about the North-South divide, but it is also a political project. And the political project uh, uh, has for its subject, uh, uh, the subaltern groups uh, the world over. Uh, I myself have uh, tried to capture uh, this uh, sort of um, uh, political project by talking about a class-centered intersectional approach to international, to international law. And I think this is a very, very salient, uh, salient point uh, because uh, if you confine to a, uh, to simply being a uh, simply being a geographical project, So, um, 
It looks like we may have lost him. Perhaps you'll have to continue this chain of thought until we, she returns, if that's okay. Yeah, it looks like we may have uh, lost him. So we'll dial in. In, in, in the interim, if you can, you know, there, there, there's one question which sort of strikes at this and uh, perhaps we can take it now and wait. Question strikes at the heart of the Twill scholarship and, 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 the, and the project it seeks to undertake. Uh, and this is that, can Twill, Twill be a self-standing theory of international law? Hasn't it been aggressively critiqued from mainstream theories? Would it survive the critiques and analysis? Perhaps you can also uh, use this moment to, to explain how this is different from the new approaches to international law by, by, by Kennedy. So. Right, right, right. Um, but it's, I, I think, you know, I, I think we should really, uh, I don't want to get too much into discussing uh, deeper themes before Chimney returns. And I think we should allow him to develop the, uh, the very important points that he was trying to uh, put on the table, um, particularly his, uh, his uh, pioneering work uh, on international law, particularly to bring a class-centered uh, approach, as he was saying. Uh, uh, for many of us, Simney's critical work was what we found inspired us in the 90s uh, uh, because there wasn't anything really critical out there, you know, when we were work starting to work in the 90s. Now I think the reality is very different. Um, but uh, in any case, as far as these, this particular question is concerned, uh, can Trail be a self-standing theory, um, I, I'm not sure how to answer that um, or how it will survive the critiques because much, uh, everything in the end survives the critiques in the sense that no dominant theory of international law has completely disappeared. Um, we have, for example, a strong sort of belief in theories of positivism it's not as though positivism disappeared because it was critiqued by a range of so many other theories, uh, not just naturalism, but then you know the policy-oriented approaches, the critical approaches, the feminism, third world approaches, but it's still not disappeared anywhere. It's a very dominant approach. And I would, I would similarly say that in many ways, uh, these different understandings of international law are like, uh, you know, perhaps you think about them as uh, the, the different layers of uh, an onion or something. You know, it, it's, it, you, you remove one layer and then there are other layers beneath it and uh, they're not going anywhere. Uh, and similarly, I would say, I don't think we can understand any one of them as a self-standing theory in that sense, because just like an onion, you can understand one layer, you know, alone or one leaf of an onion, you know, as a separate thing, you know, it, it makes sense only together as an onion, you know, and which consists of many different layers. And so you can't understand, for example, positivism without understanding, you know, other critiques that I've actually tried to engage with. And I would say the same thing about Twail. Uh, I don't think you can make sense of Twail unless you know what it is that it is critiquing. Uh, and to that extent, it is very much in interaction with the other theories of international law. Um, uh, however, having said that, it may very well be that during particular times that we live in, certain theories of international law have more dominance than others. For example, the policy-oriented approach to international law, <coughs> you could say, by and large, had a dominant sort of influence on what we consider to be international law when it coincided with the period of American hegemony. Because policy approaches to international law became tantamount to justifying American power. 
in many ways. And it came out of the Yale you know, School of Jurisprudence. And, um, but as with the decline of American hegemony and American power, as we are witnessing the, the times that we are living in, it may very well be that policy-oriented approaches may also decline in, uh, in justification. For example, a theory, a, a doctrine such as a responsibility to protect, for example, which was uh, a classic tool of a policy-oriented approach to you know, international law. Uh, before the emergence of the R2P idea, it used to be called as a right to democratic intervention. And there are articles written about it in the, in the 80s. And this is way before the emergence of the R2P. Uh, and those uh, arguments were used for uh, actual military interventions in countries. For example, the Panama intervention in 1989 was justified as a case of you know, uh, uh, the right to pro-democratic intervention. And uh, leading journals like American Journal of International published articles, you know, uh, uh, basically acknowledging and pushing for such an understanding. But you know that could be very different now. So uh, by and large, that's what I would say. It, the, these theories go through ups and downs. Yeah, Professor Chimney is back. So uh, Professor Chimney, we were just discussing our questions in the chat box. Uh, you, yeah. You make... yeah, I would suggest uh, that uh, let's go down that path, and if there is some time, I might say something because I, I see another question in the chat box. Uh, which, uh, but, but is it possible, respect, respectfully, Chimney, is it possible for you to please share your views, uh, however short they are, before we, we go down to question? I'm very eager to listen to your your points uh, which are very important okay uh, no I, 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 uh, so i was just saying that uh, uh, the importance uh, of looking at twail as a political project uh, uh, is especially important today uh, in the post pandemic era because of the growing inequalities in the world uh, across class, gender, race, uh, indigenous peoples, you know, along all those uh, lines. Uh, and this issue of inequality has been flagged repeatedly uh, by no less a person than the UN Secretary General. Uh, I highly recommend to anybody who wants to have a sense of the post-pandemic era to read the short uh, sort of uh, presentation or lecture of the UN Secretary General that he dis delivered last June. Uh, this was the Mandela lecture, where he highlighted uh, uh, this fact of growing inequalities uh, in, in the world. Uh, and these are serious inequalities uh, because among other things, uh, even the World Bank's conservative figures tell us that uh, poverty, extreme poverty is going to grow uh, in, the, uh, in the global south by at least another 200 million people. And my sense is that's a gross, uh, that's a gross underestimate. Likewise, the, the the, the, the crisis which we are confronting uh, in, this, uh, in the environmental sphere, uh, especially climate change, uh, its impact is going to be felt uh, most on the poorest uh, nations as well as the, uh, the, the, the weakest groups, if I may put it that way, the most marginalized groups within them. The same is true of the uh, emerging digital uh, crisis. So if you go crisis by crisis, you will see that in the post-pandemic era, the burden of uh, you know, the crisis is going to be shifted onto uh, the subaltern sections in both the global north and in the, in the global north, in the global south. Uh, 
And in the light of that, I think there is a need to uh, think about a counter hegemonic uh, strategy that uh, uh, that Professor uh, Rajgopal was uh, sp speaking uh, speaking about. So that's one point that I wanted to make. The only other point I wanted to mention was uh, that while there seems to be some introspection and self reflection within uh, urban studies, if I if, if I if I gathered right, that this self reflection is not simply about among critical urban studies scholars not simply among critical geographers and, and so on, but in the discipline uh, in general. Uh, but I don't see such uh, self-reflection uh, within, uh, 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 within the discipline of international, within the discipline of international law. Uh, while there is uh, some degree of acceptance of twill, uh, much of mainstream uh, scholarship believes uh, uh, that they need to do, uh, they need to do more of what they have been doing for more than a century, for more than a century and a half, and this seems to be the uh, case with a with a number of other disciplines. Uh, I just recently was reading uh, a write up on development economics uh, by leading uh, by leading uh, uh, economists from the global south who pointed out that uh, much of development economics was um, dominated by Northern institutions, by Northern scholars, who not only, do they dominated in various ways, including doing gatekeeping when it came to, uh, uh, when it came to uh, publishing. Uh, same is case, for instance, of refugee studies, uh, where several surveys have uh, you know, been undertaken to show how the global uh, the voices from the global south are almost negligible, despite the fact that uh, uh, most refugees in the world come today from the from the global south. So I think that's a very critical point uh, as to uh, understand why this self-reflection doesn't take place even in the face of the multiple crises. Uh, that the world is engulfed in. Uh, and these crises are not no ordinary crises. They are crises which are uh, uh, threatening life on planet Earth. These are crises uh, which are talking about, uh, uh, which are threatening the integrity of what I call the self. Uh, and despite these crises, uh, uh, at least in mainstream international law, I find uh, very little, uh, very little self-reflection. If you take the leading journals uh, in international law, uh, but from one odd article uh, uh, coming from the critical approaches, uh, whether from the from uh, from the feminist standpoint, the twelve standpoint, or the Marxist standpoint, uh, much of the scholarship proceeds on the lines that it had uh, it had always proceeded. So one of the things that we need to reflect on is uh, how do we uh, how do we sort of compel a change? How do we get the mainstream to how do we get the mainstream to reflect on the crisis uh, which uh, which is visiting the discipline? It is staring us in the face, and yet there seems to be no there seems to be no uh, there seems to be no movement. A final point, uh, again, uh, uh, arising from Professor Raj Gopal's work, uh, is a uh, is a theme that's you know debated on and off within uh, uh, Twail and other critical approaches, uh, which is that uh, should Twail commit itself uh, to the reform of international law and international institutions? Or should it be satisfied with simply advancing a critique uh, of mainstream international law as well as uh, you know institutions and practices and and so on and so forth? I think that's another very important uh, debate. Uh, to put it differently, whether Twail needs to articulate an alternative vision uh, of uh, a, a global order, alternative vision of global law alternative vision of global institutions and so on and uh, so forth. Uh, 
I personally stand for reform uh, because I believe that uh, taking a nihilist standpoint uh, when it comes to reform, that is, uh, um, is not very is not very helpful. I just wanted to flag. Uh, I just wanted to flag that theme. Uh, so with those three remarks uh, uh, back to you, Ankit, and uh, allow me to thank uh, Raj once again. Uh, for the very profound uh, remarks. Uh, and uh, I'm, I'm quite certain that uh, a number of uh, those who are attending this talk will have uh, uh, questions uh, to ask of him. And I should, uh, I should not take up that space. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir. Uh, we'll go, we'll take the latest question first, and then we'll go upwards. So we have uh, Riju Ray, who, who asks that uh, the contributions of Twill to contexts where spatiality such as frontier making and law making have historically gone hand in hand. The legal historian, my question is what kinds of interventions can Twill scholarship make in borderland and frontier regions of South Asia? which are also marked by complex forms of conflict between indigenous groups and possibly displaced persons. So, whoever would like to take your job. Well, I think, uh, now, uh, let me just briefly say that uh, I think there is, you know, 12 scholarship that is Twail One, which is the early generation of Twail scholars such as R.P. Anand and Bedjawi and others uh, who contributed to the critical understanding of international law in the immediate post-independence period of 50s and 60s and 70s. And, and then we have Twail Two, which have scholars such as uh, 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 Chimney, and uh, uh, you know, um, and many others who contributed to the formation of the ideas that built on that. And um, um, and I think you know what we have seen is that, uh, and I myself see myself as kind of joining the tail end of you know twelve two in some ways. Uh, but that there, there is of course a whole range of new understandings and critiques of. Uh, of international law, including by those who work on indigenous legal history and those who work on, you know, um, uh, uh, of frontier issues that are raised by the frontier uh, question that has been raised, and uh, um, and I I would encourage an engagement with this this work, and I would say that, you know, both in terms of coloniality. Um, in terms of the contributions of Twail to the understanding of coloniality, the received forms of colonial power and their reproduction over time, as well as the question of, uh, uh, as I said in my remarks, the question of place and context. Uh, those are areas where we have seen Twail try to engage with some of the issues which uh, might actually be quite relevant for the for the frontier uh, question, particularly the relationship between you know, legal orders, but also in the process of displacements, for example, that occur through new forms of intervention and land appropriation uh, that we see uh, in the frontier. So uh, uh, that's kind of my quick response, but I'm sure Chimney can jump in on this as well. Uh, no, I, I, again, I have uh, nothing really to uh, really to add to that. I would also join you in encouraging engagement, especially looking, uh, you know, tracing the genealogy of some of the uh, uh, conflicts uh, that you see, uh, not only in South Asia but uh, in the Asian region, uh, Asian region as a whole. And unless we go back to understanding the colonial production of particular 
kinds of frontiers and boundaries uh, uh, and uh, also the production of certain kind of ethnicities. Uh, it was very difficult for us to uh, really understand the, uh, the contemporary, contemporary situation. Uh, so yes, I think we need to, uh, we really need to uh, uh, engage with these issues. But here lies my sort of trepidation, uh, is that there isn't there enough uh, scholarship and understanding, I mean, in the sense of Edward Said and his work on Orientalism and how this colonial project worked, it's, it's, it's more about finding practical solutions and working as, as the questioner suggests with, with these areas and uh, these regions which were marred with disputes and somehow have a more, I mean, immersed in history, of course, fine, but also forward looking in terms of finding the solution. Is this is there is that is it more about actually a practical outlook as opposed to a academic exercise which and is there a lacuna between these two or uh, how can't place this right 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 I mean I, I see where you're going with this um uh, I, I I'm I'm you know, I'm I'm pretty sure that uh, you know the context is very different in different countries. Uh, for example, the way indigenous groups deal with uh, their displacement in uh, Israel. For example, I'll go back to the example of the Bedouins. the The Bedouin context is very different from the context of, say, indigenous communities in India. Uh, uh, because of the nature of uh, you know, questions that arise, but also because of the nature of the legal regimes that intersect. For example, the 2018 Supreme Court judgment in Israel that declared that Bedouins actually can be, you know, uh, moved around, basically, that they don't have any rights um, in the al Khmer dispute. That, that decision essentially interpreted uh, old Ottoman law, with, uh, which under which you know, the Bedouins had enjoyed certain so-called primordial rights as uh, being uh, not important or relevant at all. And so the, the, the so a strategy for the Bedouin community in many ways uh, consisted of trying to win recognition of their rights under the Ottoman, you know, Ottoman uh, legal regime, which under traditional understanding of Israeli law, they, uh, felt gave them rights, but until they were declared not to have any rights with the Supreme Court. But I think you know the situation is very different with regard to uh, you know frontier lands in South Asia, which don't have a similar sort of uh, question of uh, you know layering of pre-existing legal systems and, and and in fact have won many so-called paper what you might call as paper rights under you know, uh, India's own legal system uh, for indigenous communities, whether uh, under, the, you know, under the constitution or under new laws such as the, you know, the, the Forest Rights Act, for example, that have provided specific protections for indigenous communities, but have remained largely frustrated in practice for a variety of different reasons. So uh, I think the situation is very different in different countries. In some countries, it's a question of non-recognition, like in Israel. But in other countries, like in India, it's not a question of non-recognition, but of non-implementation or, or a gap between recognition and uh, realization that is quite stark in the Indian context. Um, so it's kind of hard to kind of answer in a more specific way about strategies, but it depends on the countries in question. Yeah, uh, I just wanted to add that when you sp uh, speak about uh, uh, sort of pragmatic interventions, uh, offering solutions, uh, uh, you're spot on. Uh, but uh, the question is what kind of, uh, you know, solution you want to offer, uh, because there is no, unique or singular uh, 
res response available to 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 any problem let me give you an example uh, so uh, today one of the key issues uh, is what has been called vaccine apartheid uh, where uh, large parts of global south people are without uh, have not been vaccinated and one of the response to this has been uh, that india brazil uh, and uh, india south africa and nearly 100 other nations have gone to the uh, wto asking for a waiver of the trips tax that is the agreement on trade related intellectual property rights uh, which has which has as yet not taken place so here are three solutions that are on the table uh, one solution could be the solution that the global north uh, uh, especially countries like germany switzerland uh, uh, norway uh, are offering uh, which is that we won't waive the trips uh, agreement but we will uh, 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 you know undertake other measures uh, you know which uh, would ensure uh, you know the supply of vaccines uh, to uh, you know uh, to uh, to peoples of the global south a second uh, as a solution which is again a pragmatic solution is the one that india and south africa have offered that a temporary waiver of the trips agreement so that the supply of vaccines can be uh, scaled up a third solution could be a much more radical solution which is a rehaul of the intellectual property rights text because there is a worldwide consensus and this consensus comes uh, uh, is across the spectrum from neoclassical economists like jagdish bhagwati uh, to the more radical uh, economists there is a worldwide consensus that the trips text is inherently flawed and if uh, uh, th this is the consequences of it for this pandemic but similar would be the situation thereafter to put it differently here are three solutions and the point is which solution should we see as, you know as the one that we should uh, that we should uh, we should uh, we should advance in other words the pragmatic interventions are being talked about also by mainstream international law scholars it's not that the mainstream uh, liberal scholars are not talking about reforming international law but their vision of reform is dramatically different from the vision of reform that twail or the feminist uh, approaches uh, uh, approaches are advancing so when i said yes uh, we have to debate this issue of reform or revolution uh my the point i wanted to make is that having advanced the critique from within the twail standpoint from within the twail paradigm uh, do we push ahead and then advance uh, proposals of reform however radical uh, radical uh, radical they are uh, or do we stop with it uh, and it wasn't a plea for just being pragmatic because Uh, the mainstream has been uh, always been pragmatic they will always tell you uh, that some tinkering here some tinkering there uh, some little bit of revision here in the text uh, some resolution there can actually make the uh, system uh, uh, move forward uh, but that is far from being the case as we have seen uh, at least seven decades after the decolonization uh, process began so that's what uh, so so the so the point i would like to make is that i think we need a debate over what is practical intervention what is it to be pragmatic uh, what is uh, it to um have the responsibility of finding uh, uh alternative uh, sort of uh, Uh, uh answers uh, to problems that confront the uh, you know subaltern peoples the the world over uh i think that calls for much more attention than we have uh, received and my own teaching experience tells me that most people who come and do international law want to bring about change they want to change bring about change and their energies need to be mobilized uh you know uh, um, uh, uh and one way of no, doing that is to take this theme seriously and 
work through it. Now, shifting grounds to geography, there is a question by Luciano Coelho who asks, can Twail respond to the struggles of, of all the different subaltern groups under the umbrella of Third World? Examples include landlocks, developing states, small island developing states, indigenous groups. Is it time to think about different sets of Third World approaches? And to this I would like to just throw in Latin America, which has experienced the colonial project but, but has had a rather different perspective to it and, and, and is not really mainstream discussion in, in international law. It remains responsible for, for many operations and, and achievements of international law. I, I think uh, uh, Chimney is uh, is well positioned to answer this well much debated question. Do um, you want to take a first crack this time? Okay. Uh, yeah. So uh, it is the answer is both yes and no. Uh, the the no clearly uh, is reflected in the fact that there is already. Uh, there are already approaches which call themselves fourth world approaches to uh, international law. And that's partly because, uh, and uh, you know, uh, the, the, the second generation of Toil scholarship or the third generation has not adequately addressed the, uh, the concerns uh, and the situations of indigenous uh, peoples, for example. Likewise, there's been a critique that um, um, you, you know, Twail has not taken the issue of caste uh, sufficiently, sufficiently, uh, sufficiently seriously. Uh, so yes, uh, uh, as of now, uh, we can say that we need uh, we need hundred flowers to bloom, <laughs> even within Twail, uh, so that uh, you, you know uh, the 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 diversity that has been alluded to. Uh, in terms of uh, subaltern groups and marginalized groups, uh, their concerns can be addressed. The yes is that, uh, you know, that Twail essentially advances a broad theoretical frame. As you all know, there's great amount of internal diversity within uh, Twail. Uh, but having said that, Twail advances a broad frame which can be used uh, to address the concerns of all the groups. Uh, that have been uh, that uh, all the groups that have been uh, that have been uh, that have been mentioned. Um, uh, uh, the only point I would uh, uh, sort of insist on is that while there's great amount of uh, diversity within Twail, there are some features of Twail, or at least one feature, let me say, of Twail that. Uh, uh, that those who want to uh, sort of see themselves as twailers or self-identify as twailers must uh, must take on board, uh, which is that uh, 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 in my archaic uh, uh, language, uh, imperialism remains the central feature of the global order. You want to use empire, you want to use hegemony, uh, you can have your pick, but uh, the global order is still uh, you know, uh, dominated by a handful of uh, states and by what I call the dominant social, uh, by the dominant social, uh, uh, dominant social classes. As long as you accept that feature, uh, which provides the broad frame for Twail, uh, I think uh, you can address these, uh, these, uh, the, the problems of these diverse uh, groups even as you may wish to identify yourself as the fifth or sixth or seventh generation of Twailers. We, I at least, uh, as probably the oldest among the Twailers, would warmly welcome it. Professor? Yeah, uh, I, I don't have anything much to say. I mean, I agree with uh, Chimney's position about the yes and no uh, dimensions of this. Um, Twail is is uh, is uh, an inevitable framing for the aspirations of many uh, groups that are dissatisfied with the way the system works and that seek to bring about change. 
uh, and they need a language, uh, a framing. And Twail, for better or worse, is a framing that is available. And um, having said that, it's uh, also a framing that is obviously not going to be adequate for the specificities of particular demands. Uh, and this has been the case in, with any critical approach when critical legal studies you know, uh, emerged as a set of critical ideas about law in the American academy. Of course, it was uh, uh, pointed out about its uh, lack of engagement on, for example, on issues of race. Uh, critical race theory emerged as a, a simultaneous, but nevertheless, uh, a distinctive sort of uh, understanding of the role of law in producing racial hierarchies which the mainstream critical legal studies approaches had not paid sufficient attention to. Similarly, in the case of feminism, there was a sense that the critical legal studies approaches did not really sort of adequately articulate the concerns of uh, subaltern, the largest subaltern group, the concerns of women and of uh, the uh, questions of gender more broadly. Uh, and I would say that those kinds of concerns are, are engagements are going to be quite common, really. But I think the broader point is what uh, Chimney leaves us with, I think, uh, which I subscribe to that. I think, you know, international law, particularly in the, in the critical moments after World War II and the moment after the end of the Cold War and the sort of the, the consolidation of a new wave of international lawmaking and institutions such as the WTO, for example, was some, an institution that came together in the middle in 1994. And at that time, there was a need for an alternative oppositional uh, critical language and a critical vocabulary to express the concerns of a whole lot of people. And they all each had their own particular concerns, but they had to find some way to sort of engage with the inadequacy or the dominance or the hegemony or the imperial nature of the regime that they were facing. And I believe uh, that Twail has provided that, uh, that, that, you know, that space for people. Uh, it's not to say that there is a singular understanding of Twail that satisfies all groups. It's never gonna be the case. Thank you. Uh, we've got three questions, perhaps we we'll stick to one. These are by Fazil Atik and after this, perhaps we can end. Um, there is one shared, there is another one shared, so perhaps we will take two questions. This first one is from Fazil Atik. This is, uh, he asked, the critical legal study of Marty Koskiniemi introduces the theory of dual character of normativity and correctness in the international legal argument. How do Twail see the fluidity in international legal argument affect on the legal interests on Global South? I'll share the last question as well and then it can be addressed accordingly. This is Dijin who asks, should not you think that the existing international law as suffers from an original sin of being Eurocentric colonial couldn't, re couldn't be reconstructed or corrected? If yes, should the universalization approach of international law be stopped at some point and start a regional international law like the South and North international law. Professor Rajagubhan, start. Yes. Okay, uh, very briefly, these are very broad uh, questions that require much sort of thinking and engagement. Um, but um, uh, just maybe on the question of fluidity, I'll just say something. Um, I mean, the idea that uh, law is fluid um, is, again, it's not a new uh, insight or a, or a you know, uh, especially a specific contribution of uh, any particular theory, uh, including that of Twail. Twail didn't establish that international law uh, legal arguments are more fluid, for example. Uh, there are others, whole lot of others who have been arguing before that, uh, whether, uh, you know, uh, 
uh, theorists uh, that have linked themselves to policy outcomes like uh, the Yale School or others who have argued for more open-ended understanding of uh, international legal argument. Um, and what I would uh, just say that uh, is that um, uh, the fluidity of international law is both its uh, character as well as its uh, its uh, its bo both its uh, 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 it, it's both its benefit as well as its uh, its um, uh, shall we say a liability uh, in the sense that uh, the openness of international law the fluidity of the arguments uh, are. Uh, what makes the endless deployment of international law in the interests of power relations. But at the same time, it's the openness and the fluidity of international law and international legal argument that allows for contestation of those deployments by particular groups. And Trail, I think, has very effectively sort of explored this form of fluidity in a variety of different ways um, and tried to sort of point out ways in which uh, uh, the spaces or gaps that you find within what appear to be so-called fixed international law or legal structures can still provide uh, the opportunities for what Professor Chimney has been calling as reform. Uh, uh, they are not immutable structures that are beyond penetration that the insinuation of particular instances of oppositional practices into those structures can lead to changes in those structures themselves. And I think you know, many 12 groups have actually specifically seen the, uh, the uh, dynamic nature of the relationship between this, uh, these two elements, between uh, you know, Marty Koskenyumi's uh, normativity and concreteness dynamism. Thank you. Professor Jimney, uh, you can take yeah. the next question and uh, uh, add if you would like to this as well. Yeah, no, thank you. Uh, just a quick observation on the first question and, uh, and likewise on the second. On the first question, uh, I personally uh, feel that this whole uh, uh, feature of fluidity of international law or of law is uh, is uh, is exaggerated. Law is not as fluid as it is made out to be, uh, so that it can be subject of easy contention with between opposing parties. Uh, you know, uh, take the TRIPS agreement again. Uh, where is the fluidity? Uh, for for one year, <laughs> there are hundred countries wanting to change. Ask for a simple waiver, a simple elementary waiver of the TRIPS text. There's no fluidity there. Uh, there is no opportunity for individual personal interventions of international lawyers who want to bring about change. Uh, so, 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 but that's a large theme uh, about fluidity, indeterminacy, et cetera, et cetera. My own take is uh, very different. Colonial international law was not fluid as far as global south was concerned. <laughs> we, we were just simply subjected to it. Uh, so far as uh, the second question, I, I think uh, uh, this is a question that um, uh, the first generation of 12 scholars encountered uh, uh, in the post-colonial period. Uh, what do we do with colonial international law? Uh, do we simply reject it? and try and construct de novo from scratch, a new international legal order? Or are we, because of the nature of the global order, because of the central feature of imperialism, we are compelled to engage with what was colonial international law and to try and bring about transformation of that law uh, in so far as uh, in so far as it uh, in so far as it is uh, possible, and certainly one way of doing that is to develop approaches in the regions, say in Africa or in Asia or in Latin America, uh, that uh, can collectively uh, you know indicate uh, the changes 
that you need to bring uh, that you need to bring about it's often forgotten that many of uh, that the, the 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 first toilers came from latin america in the 19th century and it is their hard work uh, for example in proposing uh, uh, as a, in the early 20th century of peaceful methods of uh, settlement of disputes uh, that worked itself uh, its way into the un charter so so uh, so already the twelers have made that uh, have made substantial uh, substantial contribution uh, but the possibility of a complete overhaul or or the revolution uh, uh, is simply uh, uh, is is simply disallowed by reality uh, you, you know um, uh, and therefore uh, we have to find you know a diverse set of strategies in bringing about uh, you know the changes that we think are uh, to the uh, for the benefit of our peoples of the global south the subaltern peoples the world uh, over again my sense is that these what can be these strategies have not received sufficient uh, some of these have worked raj mentioned uh, the 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 right of peasants uh, you know text and the role of via campesina uh, and you know the range of uh, peasant movements uh, that were mobilized uh, so that was in a sense successful now now you don't expect it to overnight bring about substantial change on the ground but at least at the normative level you have brought about some change so uh, yeah so this is going back to raj's uh, initial point about you know the growing uh, space for pluralism but how do we use that growing space of for you know for pluralist activities to bring about the kind of transformation that we have in mind i think requires a lot more uh, thought just as a preliminary thought what about existing uh, organizations like ASEAN or a SARC or a or perhaps even a BRICS. Why can't these become catalysts for mobilization and collective thinking, like how it was imagined in the Bandung conference? So there have been. So there are these ebbs and flows in the you know in the coalitional global south movement. So at in the hey days you had the non-aligned movement. Uh, you know. Uh, uh, which was very, extremely inclusive and which had the support of most global south uh, nations uh, which gave way to uh, which uh, sort of yielded among other things the group of 77 in the economic institu institutions so there are these ebbs and flows so at one point BRICS was seen as a possible uh, element in the counter hegemonic strategy but uh, it has not turned out to be uh, what was expected. So precisely, uh, uh, Ankit, your question that we we have not sufficiently ex examined these, uh, you know, and also to see to differentiate, and which would be my last point to differentiate between the counter hegemonic role of states, uh, which uh, <laughs> yeah, which are influenced by the elites and the counter hegemonic movement of peoples you know social movements uh, etc uh, because at the level of elites uh, i don't think dramatic change is going to come about even if you take the brics institutions for example the brics development bank the global south has been critiquing the imf for god knows how many decades for having a weighted voting system and the brics bank uh, development bank uh, adopts that very method so uh, so uh, as far as i know uh, so my sense is that this is the these are the areas ripe for this calling out for research uh, uh, rather than get into you know some very fancy notions often advanced by our colleagues in the critical legal studies uh, movement uh, which uh, don't have much to say to the realities of uh, you know uh, the poor and marginalized.
professor are you on mute final words and then we can uh, conclude yeah sorry i we are muted myself again um <clears throat> uh just uh, very quickly on the um, on the regional international law possibilities which is also tied to or is part of a broader question about alternative sites for the rearticulation of international law such as the rise of brics or uh, uh other forms of regional groupings um i, I must say i'm i'm uh, i've I, I, i've been a skeptic all along you know of the ability of uh of a regional grouping that is led by states uh, and that is rooted in the traditions and practices of uh, you know law making by states uh, to bring about a change in the structure and the practice of international law so regional international law whether it's uh, latin american or african or or south asian uh, by itself is not going to lead to an alternative uh or uh, answer many of the criticisms that twail has developed about the uh the inadequacies of international law it will only end up reproducing it at the regional level you know what was what we were criticizing as being a eurocentric framework for law uh is not going to suddenly become better just because the law is now made by south asians or law is now made by africans on their own um and i think the key issue goes to uh, i think what i hear is the kind of a consensus among me and um and and chimney on this that uh, there is a fundamental sort of difference between a westphalian status approach to international law and a broader pluralistic framework of international law that has enough space or openness for actors such as social movements that while it may not fundamentally transform the entirety of international law from top to bottom still can provide enough sites where the hegemony of particular understandings of international law can be contested and new understandings can be put forward for example even the trips agreement i would say i agree with everything that professor chimney said uh we should also remember though that um uh, when the trips agreement was in the way of uh, bringing about an answer to the global aids crisis this was in the 90s and uh, the push back against it was organized by social movements in south africa in pretty much the you know uh, the community of people affected by the global aids crisis around the world uh, and that led to a rearticulation of the politics behind uh, the trips provisions uh, that were being used as a refuge for defending you know the non action uh, on the on the part of uh, you know countries with regard to access to vaccines uh, and medicines in the 90s and uh, we all know that uh, the politics of that moment is what kind of drove forward the the momentum that resulted in the doha declaration on public health uh which attempted to sort of offer certain ability of countries to try to find a way to get around uh some of the you know provisions some of the constraints that we had felt with the trips agreement so trips certainly looms large especially in the pandemic post pandemic period but i would not put it past the capacity of a pluralistic account of international law including the power of social movements to rearticulate it uh assuming there is sufficient mobilization around it we let's not imagine that the the barriers posed by something like trips would remain as barriers forever so i remain quite optimistic that way professor chimney final words and then we can close no i i i think uh, we should uh, let our guest uh, professor rajkopal have the last words <laughs> thank you thank you raj thank you professor uh, i thank all the participants as well this has been a very engaging and thought provoking discussion the participation by by 
by not only our speakers but also by the participants has been wonderful we're thankful and we welcome welcome this and uh, we will not stand between you and dinner so thank you everyone we return next week and uh, return with a different topic and different speakers and we thank our speakers for sharing their thoughts their experiences and perhaps their their, their critical scholarship which, which has inspired generations of thinkers and, and students like myself i'm grateful to both our speakers whose readings i have read and inspired inspired me and the, the, the motivation to change so thank you thank you to everyone present and uh, good evening thank you thank you professors thank you so much